Welcome to God, Beer, and People. So we are in the book of Numbers. We've gone this far. So, um, so I just thought how appropriate. I might as well play with some numbers, which I'm horrible at math. But um, here's the key to remembering how many books are in the Old Testament versus the New Testament. If you were to count the letters in in the Old Testament, um, Old has three, Testament has nine. So that can show you, oh, 39 books of the Old Testament. What's fun though is if you were to multiply three by nine or three times nine, then you would get, you guessed it, 27. And that's how many books are in the New Testament. So fun fact, that's how I uh, remember how many books are in the Old versus the New just the numerical structure in the Bible really displays this deliberate design, this intelligent design. It's not an accident. It's not a coincidence. This is a book that was written by 40 different authors in different time periods. Over thousands of years, they still have the same integrated integral message just the structure and the prophecy demonstrate the handiwork of god so not only the numerical structure that happens in the bible just the prophecy that has been fulfilled so that's how we can trust that our bibles hold that our bibles complete and our bible is honest so i'd like to welcome you guys to the book of numbers I know in the introduction we had said that we were going to combine the book of Numbers and the book of Deuteronomy. And fun fact, um, there's good news and bad news. The bad news is we're not going to be combining the book of Numbers and the book of Deuteronomy. But the good news is uh, we are going to get an entire presentation on the book of Deuteronomy. So we won't be covering it today. I need to recap of what we've learned so far if you haven't tuned in. So Genesis tells us that we have this fall from paradise from Eden and that happened by rebellion man separated themselves from God and the tree of life so this eternal life but in Genesis 3 15 gives us this good news that hey someone is coming for reparation someone coming to give us back what we lost so that begins this entire Bible story where's this someone coming from well in Genesis chapter 12 um, through chapter 50 we're following this family history we have abraham whom god made a promise or a covenant that his descendants will become a nation and through that nation all peoples of the earth will be blessed and guess what god affirmed that promise in uh, genesis chapter 28 verse 14 to israel so we're following this family or the descendants of Israel 12 sons now grouped as 12 tribes called the Israelites now 430 years have gone by and that kind of brings us in the book of Exodus the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt but God has freed them from bondage that's what Exodus means the Israelites exiting Egypt now they're given these 10 commandments and various case laws so now they have these rules based on relationship i am the lord your god who brought you out of egypt this is how to have a relationship when you're in the land of promise in uh, the land of canaan so guess what as a group as a nation they enter this covenant or this contract or this promise with god they agree to this they say we will do everything the lord has said we will be obedient now they built this tabernacle um, it's this portable worship center known as the dwelling place of god so now in the book of leviticus which was the last presentation we covered, the Israelites learn how to worship in their new tabernacle. The Lord has given them these laws that is going to set them apart from other nations. So that's what we've learned in the book of Leviticus. Their spiritual holiness is symbolized by physical perfection. They are to be the Lord's holy people, worshiping him in this holy manner while they wait for the holiest of holies now that plan has a whole lot of holes in it and we're going to read about that in this book of numbers
Okay, so kind of geographically, remember they were in the land of Goshen during the book of Exodus. Now the Israelites have exited Egypt and they have been camping in the Sinai wilderness. And that's been happening since Exodus 19, they've been camping. In fact, the entire book of Leviticus was recorded at Mount Sinai. So they haven't gone into Canaan yet, the promised land. Canaan up here on your screen uh, today would be the nation of Israel. They have yet to go into the land of Canaan. So just note that when you read Numbers chapters 1 through 10, know that geographically they are still at camp in Sinai. They're getting instructed or preparing to leave from Sinai to Kadesh. So on the screen, I have um, Kadesh, which is north of Sinai. What this tabernacle would look like. Um, remember, it's a portable worship center. So they're taking this down and they're popping it up, taking it down and popping it up as they travel from Sinai to the land of Canaan. Uh, here's thank you to BiblePlaces.com because I was able to retrieve this reconstruction picture of what the tabernacle or this tent would have looked like um, as they traveled through the wilderness. At Sinai, they're given preparations before they depart to Canaan. That's going to happen through chapters 1 through 4. God commands a census to be taken on all able-bodied men 20 years and older. Now, these are men who were able to go to work uh, counting each son from each tribe. So able-bodied men 20 years and older. The census on your screen, 603,550. So it goes to show how big these 12 tribes are. Now, the reason we are counting able-bodied men as you can tell, is organizing a military, an army that is going to establish his kingdom in the land of Canaan, the land that God promised to Abraham, that one day his descendants will become a nation. Well, they have to, or they have to conquer that land first. So we're taking a census on all able-bodied men that can go to war, which is why the book is called Numbers. It's a book of censuses. Remember on a previous presentation, I had shown you this graph these are the sons of israel now grouped as 12 tribes now they're going to be given camping assignments so chapters two through four are instructions on how to camp around the tabernacle and duties for each tribe so each tribe will have special instructions on what they're responsible for so on your screen i have uh, three tribes around the tabernacle which is in the middle three tribes on each side of the tabernacle of course 12 tribes all together surrounding the tabernacle as they camp it's really showing that god's presence is in the heart of this camp in the middle of this camp not only does god provide instructions on how to camp around the tabernacle they're also given instructions on who's responsible for carrying the furnishings of the tabernacle so who's responsible for carrying that ark of the covenant who's responsible for carrying the tabernacle itself so everyone has their own god appointed service or god appointed place chapter six now there's a special vow available both to men and women if they choose it's called the nazarite vow and it's an act of total devotion to the lord the vow required that a person abstain not only from strong drinks but from any intoxicants any fermented beverage so even the skin of a grape if you've looked at a grape before, it has like this cloudiness um, on the grape. That cloudiness is wild yeast. It's this waxy, whitish, powdery coat on the grape. Yeast can ferment. So it says, do not eat anything that comes from the grapevine. Now, I've said this before in my presentations that uh, wine is an earthly joy. But when you take this complete devotion to God, you are to find your joy and your cheer in the Lord. He is the vine. So 
that's why it says do not eat from the earthly vine from the grape or as the book of ephesians would say do not be filled with wine but be filled with the spirit so the nazare is not to cut their hairs now this is a physical reminder of their special devotion to god they are not to have contact with the dead because you're dedicated to a living god so being near a dead body would mean you're spiritually part of this world and you're not because you're serving a living god their diet their appearance their association was regulated and great question let's answer that for you to be a priest you have to be a descendant of levi remember we have 12 tribes of israel to be a priest you were born from the tribe of levi if you are a nazarite this is a voluntary committed service to the lord so to be a nazarite you voluntary voluntarily commit to serve the lord so that's the difference between a priest and a nazarite in chapter six we are given this highlighted verse it's called aaron's benediction now i want you to remember that aaron is moses's brother we've learned that aaron is a priest and to be a priest you must be from the tribe of levi so when it says that aaron is a priest we can say oh yeah i learned what that means that means he must be from the tribe of levi um so this is called aaron's benediction or aaron's blessing so each time we go through these presentations and we see a highlighted verse i want you to go back into your bible and highlight that verse so today we're highlighting numbers chapter 6 verses 24 through 26 the lord said to moses tell aaron this is how to bless the israelites so what god is saying as a priest this is how to bless the israelites so that they will have god's name on them so here's what the scripture reads the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you the lord turn his face towards you and give you peace here's something fun this was found in 1979 in jerusalem and it contains the priestly benediction from this book of numbers what we just read this contains that now this is the oldest biblical text known to us today yes even um older than the dead sea scrolls so it's called the priestly benediction amulet so look it up the israelites are in preparation to leave yes they're still at sinai they have not yet left because they've been given instructions on who's doing what then that priestly benediction or that priestly blessing was given to them the lord bless you and keep you um, which brings us to chapter 9 god will direct the people by cloud that's chapter 9 verse 17 now they're instructed that when the cloud settled that's when the israelites were to camp for the night so at night the cloud looked like fire now this cloud is a visible symbol of god's presence with israel they're off to the races they're heading from sinai to kadesh so on your screen sinai they are headed to kadesh unfortunately three days into their march they begin to complain they complain a lot about food and a lot about leadership and at one point moses cries out to god why have you given me such an ungrateful people to lead if this is how you're going to treat me you might as well just kill me wow those are very strong words from moses if sick and tired were a person you know how many of us have felt like that sometimes the burden can be too much now these people were rejecting god just note that moses was acting as the lord's agent so by fighting with moses ultimately they were fighting with god god himself was filling this burden with moses which is why god appointed anointed elders to comfort moses so god anoints 70 elders to help moses deal with the ungrateful people it's showing that god is providing mercy to moses uh, by providing other spiritual leaders and they are going to share the burden of the people 
with Moses so that Moses will not have to carry it alone. It's just something that we can keep in mind when we're going through things, um, when we're feeling overwhelmed. Take that to God and God will comfort you. God will provide mercy. They finally arrive south of the promised land, but they need to go into the land to see what it is like. One son from each tribe is to view or spy on the land of Canaan, on this promised land. Things there to ask, is it safe to invade? Are the inhabitants weak or strong? Are there a lot of people or not so many? Does the land flow with milk and honey? 12 men spy out on the land for 40 days. Then they come back to the congregation with the reports. So that's what they do. They go into the land, they spy it out, and then they're going to give a report to the rest of the congregations. In chapter 13, verses 25 through 30, of the 12 people that went to spy on the land, 10 gave a pessimistic report. 10 of the 12. Their excuse was that they were too small of people compared to the inhabitants of the land, that the people that occupied the land of Canaan were stronger than them. Of the 12 spies that went into the land, remember, 10 of them are complaining. They're saying, bad idea, don't go into the land. But however, there are two spies that gave a good report. This is showing great faith. It's this man named Joshua and Caleb. Now they say, surely we will overcome it. That's in Numbers chapter 13, verse 30. We should by all means go up and take possession of the land. However, we have these 10 Debbie Downers, these 10 negative spies that persuade the entire community, the entire group not to invade the land. Why? I don't know. Maybe they just want to go back to Egypt and be slaves rather than take a leap of faith and do something that God called them to. I don't know. So the people grumbled to Moses and Aaron again, wishing that they, you know, we would have been better off just dying in Egypt or, hey, we would have just been better off dying in the wilderness. Now, just keep in mind, this is the God who displayed his power in 10 plagues to free them from slavery, who departed the Sea of Reeds. That God brought them through the wilderness to the border of the land flowing with milk and honey. And all they have to do is go and enter that land and they will not do it. The people actually turn on Moses and they say, let's appoint a leader and go back to Egypt. Now, this clearly is a faith issue. Clearly, they forgot all the miracles that God has done for them. So we have these two faithful spies. Joshua and Caleb, who try to encourage the group. It's like, come on, guys. I'm actually going to read the verse. Chapter 14, verse 7. They spoke, Joshua and Caleb, to all the congregation, saying, The land which we pass through to spy out is exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. So do not fear the people of the land. They will be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Wow, this is like a great motivational speech, if you ask me, from Joshua and Caleb. And what does the congregation do? What do they say? Stone them, stone them. Like literally the group says stone Joshua and Caleb. That's in Numbers chapter 14, verse 10. And the Lord says to Moses, like how long will these people refuse to believe in my power? How long will they not believe in me despite all the signs which I have performed in their midst? Even the Lord's like, dude, I've done miracles in front of your eyes and you still refuse to go into the land of promise. It shows us that God is patient and merciful, but he will give us over to our desires. Often our desires are not in our best interest. And this story is a great example. So this generation didn't want to enter the promised land. They refused to enter Canaan. So God is going to allow this generation 
to do as they please. God's going to wait for this generation to die out. They wasted 40 days spying out a land that they refused to enter. So for every day wasted is one year of punishment, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb, two faithful men. So God's awaiting for this second generation to grow up. And that's who gets into this promised land. I think this book is a good reflection on how making hell is our choice. Like hell is not a place people are thrown against their will. It's a place that they choose. They chose separation from God. They chose not to enter the promised land. Guys, God's not going to force us to do anything we don't want to do. They rebelled and they chose to wander in the wilderness and they end up dying outside of the promised land. God will allow us to wander away from him. So we do have that free will. So my hope is that you guys choose to enter into the promised land. You choose to enter God's kingdom. In chapter 15, now there's this one law in this promised land, and it's a law for all. So it's for the Israelite and the non-Israelite. And that is unintentional sin can be forgiven. However, a defiant or willful rebellion is unforgivable. So those who defiantly despise God's word and blasphemes him must be, quote, cut off or punished. Uh, he is guilty of an eternal sin, which echoes what Jesus affirmed in the New Testament in the book of Mark, chapter 3, verse 29. God listed the unforgivable sin. I went over that in the book of Leviticus, the unforgivable sin. And what did God do? He let them be cut off from the promised land. They didn't want to enter it. And God said, fine, have it your way. Isn't that the slogan of this world that we live in? Have it your way. Like if you've ever gone to Burger King, that used to be their slogan, have it your way. But us citizens of the kingdom of God, we live by a different slogan. The king of kings, we say, have it Yahweh. So doing it God's way is always going to be in our best interest. Now, chapter 16 is this prejudice. This group of 250 men came to oppose Moses and Aaron. They basically said that Moses exalted himself and he's no more special than any of them. Wow. Um, they even go as far to say that Moses and Aaron are really just trying to control the priesthood. We learn that he didn't even want to lead these people. So to claim that he exalted himself is asinine. If you guys have read your Bible, which I hope you have, you remember that Moses questioned God at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. Moses saying, hey, send someone else. So clearly this was never Moses's or Aaron's will. But God chose Aaron and Moses to be his vessels. So throughout this whole process, this first generation of Israel, lights have been very stubborn very self-centered they're not seeing how Moses continually interjects on their behalf in Exodus Moses saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew and he went to the Hebrews defense and it's only for the Hebrews to, to turn on Moses causing him to flee the land of Egypt. So instead of being freed, the Israelites, guess what, stayed in oppression for a di an additional 40 years. And even after they were freed from Egypt, they complained continually. They bitched about wanting quail when God was providing them with manna. So to claim that he exalted himself is crazy. It's asinine. Now we're in chapter 17. And God speaks to Moses saying, okay, we have this dispute, so here's how we're going to solve it. Speak to the Israelites and get 12 staffs or 12 rods from them. Now, this is one liter of each tribe and write their names on it. So 12 staffs, one representing each tribe. Take each leader's staff, but... On the tribe of Levi, I want you to write Aaron's name 
on that staff, on that rod. And the Lord says, whoever staff blossoms, that's who God chooses to be the true priest. So we know that Aaron is from the tribe of Levi. So put Aaron's name on that rod, on that staff, representing the tribe of Levi. And then in chapter 17, verse 8, Aaron's staff or rod blossoms. So there you have it. Of all the Israelites, the priests are from the tribe of Levi. This is God's way of solving that problem for them. So the Israelites are here in Kadesh. They want to take this king's highway to get uh, to the east side of the Jordan River to get into the land of Canaan. In order to do that, they need to ask the king of Edom if they can pass through. So they ask the king of Edom if they can pass through. And guess what? The king says, no, you have to go around. So that's why you see that they're going to have to go or travel around Edom. But before they do, sad news, Aaron dies in chapter 20 at Mount Or. Before he passes away, um, he transfers the priestly duties to his son. So it's kind of showing us that this old generation is starting to fade out and we see this rise of this new generation. So they have to go around Edom and they come up here into the Amorite land and they ask hey can I pass through and the king of the Amorites uh, says no so he denies their request and actually sends an army to fight the Israelites and fortunately they won that battle now they finally get to the plains of Moab they get almost to their destination and they ask the king of Moab Hey, can we pass through? Now, there's this king of Moab named Balak, and he's afraid that the Israelites are going to conquer his land. He probably just heard that they cleaned house and took possession of the land of the Amorites, so he's worried. He assumes that the reason they're on his turf is they want to conquer his land. So he sends this prophet named Balaam to curse the Israelites. So the king of Moab thinks that this prophet has the power to defeat the Israelites by sorcery or by magic. I don't know. It's interesting that even Balaam thought that the God of Israel could be fought off by divinity or by magic. Anyway, I'm going back to the story. Sorry. But as scripture tells us, Balaam is unable to defeat this one true God. Um, just like the Egyptians were unable to save themselves with the very things that they idolize, they were powerless unless they placed themselves under the sign of the blood and then God would pass over. So it's kind of the same thing every time um, Balaam, the prophet, would try to curse the Israelites, he would end up blessing the Israelites. God would intervene and Balaam ends up blessing the Israelites, which is a good reminder when we're spiritually attacked, if someone spews hatred towards you, bless them. <laughs> this inscription on your screen here, this was written in a language between Aramaic and Canaanite, and it's dated back to about 800 BC. And it was discovered in 1967 by Dutch archaeologists. It's called the Prophecy of Balaam. So the prophet that we're reading about mentioned here in this book of Numbers, chapters 22 through 24, um, this inscription mentions that Balaam was a seer of gods. Now a seer is like a fortune teller or a prophet and apparently Balaam was a real dude who had a run-in with the god of the Israelites but was unable to curse him. Balaam who goes to curse the Israelites and instead blesses them and this is what he says to them. This is a very important part in this presentation is that we're following this storyline that occurred in Genesis 3.15 uh, that someone is coming and then in Genesis chapter 49 verse 10 we have this next clue and it tells us that this someone is coming from the tribe of Judah and then here Balaam 
tells us another sign. He's not even affiliated with the Israelites, and he confirms that there is a scepter coming. A scepter signifies a ruler. So a royal figure or a royal power is coming out of Israel. So I'm going to read the verse. It's in Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. It's another clue. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will come out of Israel. So here again is someone who isn't even affiliated with the Israelites affirming that someone is coming. We're in chapter 26 and chapter 27, the second census. So remember the first generation were very faithless. So they die out in various ways. They refused to enter the land of Canaan. Remember, they went and spied out the land. Twelve spies went into the land, checked it out. Ten gave a pessimistic report, said, hey, we don't want to enter it. It's not going to be good for us. In fact, that was just a lack of faith. They were choosing not to enter the promised land. So they are dying out in various ways in the wilderness. So we're finally at a point where the second generation is growing up or has grown up. Um, so that means that almost 40 years have gone by since that first census. So the only two that are left from that first generation is Joshua and Caleb. They were the two spies that were faithful. Uh, they were willing to enter into the promised land. This is why we call this book the book of numbers because it's a book of this census, of taking this census. So God calls for a second census. That's in chapter 26, verse 51. A census of men 20 years and older able to go to war. Moses has taken this generation to the border of the promised land. Throughout this entire story, we've been traveling through the wilderness, and finally we are at the border of the promised land. But God tells Moses that his time has come to an end. His mission is complete. But before he passes away, he climbs to this mountaintop. So he actually gets a good panoramic view of the promised land. Um, and, and then he says this beautiful prayer. I'm going to read it. It's in chapter 27, verse 15. This is the prayer that Moses prays. It says, May the Lord God who gives breath to all living things Appoint someone over this community to go out and come in before them, one who will lead them out and bring them in. So the Lord's people will not be like a sheep without a shepherd. So Moses is really praying for somebody to guide these people. So who is going to be the shepherd of these sheep? And it is Joshua. So Joshua is going to succeed Moses. So that's in chapter 27, verse 18. So Joshua will be this new leader of the Israelites that will be taking them into the promised land. I'm going to read this next verse. that uh, It says that Moses laid hands on Joshua. If you guys remember in the book of Leviticus, we talked about the what the laying of hands meant, and it was like a act or a designation or a transition of power. So here, Moses, by laying his hands on Joshua before the priests and before the congregation, is really publicly identifying Joshua as his successor. My favorite part of all of these presentations, I hope to do it every time, you know, um, We've learned that someone is coming, and that's what the entire Old Testament will always point to. So I'm going to walk you through it. Even though these are small details, it has a big message. So in the book of Numbers, we've learned that Aaron from the tribe of Levi, or it, throughout this entire story, we learned that Aaron from the tribe of Levi represented the priesthood. But in chapter 20 of the book of Numbers, he didn't make it into the promised land. And that's a big message because what is that saying? It's saying that being religious doesn't necessarily get you into the promised land. If we learn anything here, we learn that it is not 
priestly duties that gets you into the promised land. It's not how much theology you know or how many Bible verses you know that gets you into heaven. It's not like you get to heaven's gate and the angel of the Lord says, pop quiz, recite Ezekiel 4.12. Like that would never happen. Now we just read that Moses, who God gave his laws to, Moses who taught the law to the people, will not be leading the people into the promised land. What does that tell us? It's not performance-based. Our salvation is not performance-based, meaning if you only work harder and do more than the next guy, you'll get into the promised land. No, there's nothing you can do or earn. You're not going to get into heaven's gate and the angel of the lord pulls your church attendance that would never happen neither one of those gets you into the promised land that small detail that we picked up here in the book numbers it's not going to get you into the true promised land of heaven that's what we can take from this what is the bigger message yeshua joshua will be leading the people into the promised land it is Joshua who will be leading the people to the promised land. So in Numbers chapter 13, if you haven't read it, here's where you can find it. We find out that before Joshua was named Joshua, his original name was Hosea. Hosea means salvation in the Hebrew. So chapter 13, verse 16, Moses, Moses changes Hosea's name to Yeshua. Yeshua in Hebrew again means salvation. So we have the English translation from Yeshua to Joshua. If you can see how I'm pronouncing Yeshua, Joshua. So if we were to take Yeshua, Joshua, and translate, the English means the Lord saves. So there you have it. Only the Lord will get us into the promised land. It's not our religion. It's not what we do. It's the Lord that is salvation. And that ultimately in the book of Joshua, which we'll get to here in these presentations, Joshua ultimately leads the people into the promised land. And in this Bible story, it's only Jesus that can get us into the true promised land of heaven. Now, I'm going to dive a little deeper, um, and I'm only doing this for you Bible geeks out there. I'm going to take it one step further. The Bible was originally written in Hebrew and Aramaic and then translated uh, into common Greek. So if you were to take the Hebrew name, Yeshua, and translate it to the Greek, it's translated to Esus. So that's what happened when we took this Hebrew Aramaic Yeshua and translated it into the Greek. It's Esus. If we take the Greek Esus and translate it to English, we get Jesus. So here it is. Salvation is Jesus or Yeshua is Jesus. So salvation is Jesus. I hope you guys enjoyed that. And again, someone is coming. All right, we're closing out the book of Numbers. So the rest of the book is preparing this new generation to enter the land. If there's anything you can take from the book of Numbers, know that the first generation has died out. This is the new generation. So there's laws for offerings kind of what we've learned in the book of Leviticus and laws on vows. This is going to commemorate the 40 years of wandering, the first generation choosing not to enter into the promised land. Chapters 33 through 36 in the book of Numbers, God's going to warn the, this generation, drive out all the Canaanites. We have instructions for dividing the land laws on keeping the tribal lands in the hands of the tribal families. So, so we finished the book of Numbers. So the important verse in this book is, of course, Aaron's benediction. That's your highlighted verse. So the significance of that verse is the Lord blesses. All blessings come from the Lord. The message to the Israelites, it recounts their history of wandering. The message we can take from it 
it warns us about grumbling. Uh, that's the key to remembering, hey, what is the book of numbers about? Uh, this picture will show you. It's just numbers roaming in the desert.